session celebrating the 20th anniversary of ISMB and the 50th anniversary since the founding of NIGMS is Katie Pollard, a statistician at the Gladstone Institutes and a faculty member at UCSF whose work in trying to understand many areas of biology, but especially human biology, has inspired me. And I believe that her work now tell, telling you about when do mutations in mammalian non-coding sequences alter enhancer function will be an inspiration to you as well. So here's Katie. Thanks so much, Stephen. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here, um, especially since this is my first outing, my first conference since giving birth to my twins um, this past fall. So usually the speaker worries about the audience falling asleep. Today you guys can worry about whether I stay awake. Um, so my lab studies the genetic basis for what makes us human, and one way to explore this question is to ask us, uh, to ask what makes us different from chimps. I'm particularly interested in diseases that are specific to humans or occur at a higher rate in humans compared to non-human primates. Um, and along with some other traits here, I mention um, at the bottom of the table cardiovascular disease as an example, but other diseases that uh, humans have at a higher rate or that are specific to humans include AIDS and Alzheimer's disease. Um, I was a member of the consortium that published the chimp genome back in 2005, and this was a real breakthrough in terms of um, understanding human-specific traits, including human-specific diseases, because we were able to start using comparative genomics to understand what were the uniquely human parts of our genome. So while there are um, a number of very interesting stories about proteins that evolved uniquely during human evolution, uh, one of, to me, one of the most interesting things that came out of the Chimp Genome Project was the realization that most of the genetic basis for what makes us a human is not going to be in proteins. And this wasn't a new idea. It had been proposed more than 30 years prior based on almost no data. But when we finally had the genome sequences, we were able to confirm that indeed a lot of what makes us human from a genetic perspective is non-coding sequence. So motivated by this observation, I pioneered a method to search for functional non-coding sequences that change during human evolution. The approach that I developed uses two ideas from comparative genomics, two complementary ideas. The first one is that more distantly related species like mice and chicken and fish are very useful from the perspective of understanding which parts of the non-coding genome are most likely to be functional. So we can look for highly conserved sequences, and that conservation is indicative of function. This helps us th search through the vast non-coding territory in the genome and focus on the regions where um, changes are most likely to make a difference functionally. The second idea is that the human and the chimp genomes are nearly identical, even in their non-coding regions, nearly identical. Um, and so when we find a cluster of changes in the human genome, that's suggestive of a change of, or loss of function. So we need to develop some tools in order to implement these two ideas, and I worked very closely with Adam Siepel at Cornell University. Um, we were both in David Hausler's group at the time and um, have continued to collaborate on these projects. The first tool, the one for looking for conserved non-coding sequences, is called FASTCONS. It uses a phylogenetic hidden Markov model with two states, one for conserved and one for non-conserved sequences. We mask out, for this application, we mask out the human sequence and we look for sequences that are conserved across the other mammals. Um, the other tool, um, which I um, was the main developer for, um, is called PhiloP. It uses a likelihood ratio tests, and so it asks whether for any of these conserved non-coding sequences, now that we unmask ourselves to the human sequence, do we see more changes in human than we would expect? So an accelerated rate of substitution on the human branch. Um, so we fit a model with that kind of a parameter and one without, and we ask which one um, is more likely given the data in the multiple sequence alignment. So these tools have been implemented in a software package called FAST. It's the basis for the conservation tracks in the UCSC genome browser. And um, it's available in both as an R package and it's um, a basic C package um, for command line use. Applying the tools from FAST to uh, vertebrate sequence alignments this past year, ones that included um, now the 2X genomes as we refer to them, the low coverage mammalian genomes, um, we were able to identify now 721 human accelerated regions, or HARs. Um, this is more than three times as many as we published back in 2006, so we have a lot more now, and that's due partially to improvements in the methods and also the increased power you get from having more genome sequences. In 2006, we had only four genomes. So these are um, largely non-coding elements. 
Um, they're relatively short on average, and so we are pursuing the hypothesis that they're regulatory regions controlling expression of nearby genes, and therefore to get a handle on what role they might have played during human evolution, we look at the roles of the genes with which they are associated. HARs are enriched nearby duplicated genes, consistent with the idea that after gene duplication there can be an accelerated rate of evolution. We showed that this happens not only at the level of the protein coding genes themselves, but of their regulatory sequences. Also, they are enriched nearby developmental genes, especially transcription factors, and a number of disease genes. So these are very important genes, and you can imagine the changes in their regulation could have pretty profound phenotypic effects of the kind that we're looking for in understanding humanness. We've characterized a few of the human accelerated regions. Um, the first one on the list, the most fast evolving, is called HAR1, and we showed back in 2006 that this was a novel RNA gene. It's expressed in Cahalretzius neurons in the developing neocortex from about seven to 19 weeks gestation. And it has some structural differences between the human and the non-human form. Um, Jim Noonan and others um, have showed that HAR2 is a limb enhancer. And similarly, my lab and others have been looking at some of the other human accelerated regions with assays that um, characterize the enhancer activity of the sequences. And here's one example. HAR152, it's in a 3' prime UTR of neurogenin 2, an important developmental transcription factor. And the human-specific changes in this particular sequence have led to the destruction of a binding site for PAC6 and altered the regulation of the neurogenin 2 gene. I'm going to tell you some more examples like this um, and how we come to pick which ones we're going to follow up experimentally. And that's, that's the uh, goal of the rest of the talk today. So, what we want to do, because these experiments are somewhat time consuming and expensive, is to try to prioritize out of the 721 human accelerated regions, which ones should we try to follow up in the lab. Um, to some degree, we can start farming them out and convince other people to do experiments. We're doing some of them in my own lab, but there's still enough of them that we need some way of prioritizing which ones to look at first. So um, my approach is to pinpoint specific HARs and mutations in the HARs that we think might alter expression of nearby genes in humans compared to chimps and other mammals. And we're particularly interested in HARs that we think might be developmental enhancers for several reasons. Um, the first one is that many HARs are nearby developmentally important genes. Secondly, mutations and regulation of these genes could have profound phenotypic effects. Ph uh, developmental genes tend to um, have pretty serious functions when their expression is changed. And then um, there's also the fact that we have an experimental assay where we can measure in vivo the enhancer activity of different sequences um, in developing mouse embryos. So first I'm going to tell you about how we decide whether we think a HAR is an enhancer or not. To attack this problem, we developed a prediction algorithm. Um, for feature data, we use a number of different types of information, evolutionary conservation, a great deal of functional genomics data, um, about the state of the chromatin, about the binding of transcription factors, including P300 and other um, developmental transcription factors, and also, very importantly, DNA sequence motifs. Um, so together, these feature pieces of feature data are incorporated with a training data set. Now, there's not very much data um, about the enhancer activity of non-coding sequences, but one really good resource is the Vista Enhancer Browser. There are about 700 human sequences that have been tested in developing mouse embryos and show consistent expression in at least one tissue at day 11, E11.5. Um, and then there were about 700 more that were tested and did not show enhancer activity. And then we can also use random genomic regions as a control as well. So we put this information into a machine learning algorithm. The one that we use is a multi-kernel support vector machine. This is um, an interesting choice and important, um, so I'll just spend a second to talk about it. The multi-kernel means that for the different types of feature data, you can have a different kernel. And that's very useful if you want to actually encode the biological information in this heterogeneous um, data set in different ways. So in other words, you can use the optimal kernel for each type of data. So a spectral kernel, for example, works very well with KMERS or other kinds of sequence data, but it's not the best way to encode functional genomics information. Um, and another nice uh, feature of multi-kernel learning is that the, the actual kernel that you use in the machine learning algorithm is a linear combination of the different kernels for the different types of feature data. And therefore, each one has a, a coefficient in front of it that you learn from the data, and that tells you how important each of the different types of data was for the learning, um, the fitted learner. Um, and those are almost as important as the actual predictions that come out because they help us figure out which of these different pieces of information tell us things about, in this case, enhancer uh, function.
And you can see how those change when you change your training data or you change what other features are, are available to the algorithm. So it's been uh, very interesting for us to learn about this. The outcome is that once you have your fitted support vector machine, you can take uncharacterized regions such as the HARS and then make a prediction about whether you think they're an enhancer or not. First of all, before running HARS through, we did some cross-validation to train the classifiers and assess performance. We get an area under the ROC curve of about 94%, which is pretty good. Um, and what that translates to is at a 10% false positive rate, we have about 80% true positive rate. So then we went on and we predicted um, which HARs we thought were enhancers. And using this algorithm, we predicted about a third of them are uh, developmental enhancers. So then we wanted to try to get a little more specific and look, see if we could predict what tissue they were enhancers for. So we built additional support vector machines, this time using as positives only the cases in the Vista Enhancer browser that showed enhancer activity in that particular tissue. So let's say I want to predict brain enhancers. I take only the brain positives from Vista. And my negatives include sequences that were tested and didn't show enhancer activity and sequences that did show enhancer activity but not in brain and some other tissues. So this problem was a little bit harder than predicting whether something's enhancer or not. We get AUC values in the range of like 70 to 90 percent. Um, and at 10 percent false positive rates, this means, um, for example, for heart enhancers, we have about an 80 percent true positive rate, but for the limb enhancers, it's only about 30 percent. So some of the tissues are easier to predict than others. Um, so then our next problem, now that we have an idea about whether we think an, a HAR is an enhancer or not, and maybe what tissue it might be an enhancer for, is to identify whether we think that the human-specific substitutions would alter that activity or not. Now, on one hand, these are highly conserved non-coding sequences, so you might think that any kind of change in them would alter their function because they haven't been allowed to change throughout evolution. But on the other hand, um, since we've tested a few of them, it turns out that's not always the case. And so we want to try to figure out um, when mutations actually have an impact on function. Um, and this is actually a pretty hard problem. Um, the reason is that regulatory sequences, as everybody knows, can tolerate quite a bit of change and still function, sequence change and still function as regulatory sequences. But on the other hand, sometimes mutations have really profound, a single mutation can have a really profound uh, phenotype. So we can't just look at the total number of sequence changes and predict whether a HAR is going to have a change in function or not. And I'll demonstrate that for you in a minute with some actual data. Um, so solving this problem would be really exciting because, first of all, it helps me to prioritize these HARs for our experimental follow-up, but it also has much broader implications, of course, for example, identifying the causal variants nearby um, genome-wide association hits when they fall in non-coding regions. So it's a general question, um, and the approach that we've been taking is to combine a lot of information, so information about whether the substitution happens at a particularly conserved base or not, whether there's any functional genomics data that suggests that it might um, be important for the function of the region. Um, my lab has made predictions about which HARs we think were uh, created due to positive selection versus uh, something called biased gene conversion, which is a non-adaptive process. Um, and then finally, um, this heuristic score that we're developing accounts for something that we call transcription factor binding site divergence, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that now. So the idea is pretty simple. We just take position-specific weight matrices from JASPER and TransFAC, and we scan them across the human and the chimp version of a sequence, and we predict transcription factor binding sites, and then we ask whether there's cases where we see a binding site in one species and not in the other. And so, for example, the human substitutions could lead to a loss or a gain of binding sites in human relative to the chimpanzee sequence. So here's a visual of that. On the top, I show the chimp sequence. I mark with red X's um, eight positions that are human-specific substitutions. So you scan across with your binding matrices, and let's say you identify four binding sites in chimp, and you only identify one in the human sequence. That would be a net change of negative three. Here's another human sequence. So let's say, this is just a hypothetical example. So let's suppose the human sequence looked like this second version here. It also has eight substitutions in it. But in this case, there's still, there's four binding sites, a net change of zero. They haven't affected the prediction of transcription factor binding sites at all. So you can see that it's, depending on whether the substitutions hit the motif matches or not, and depending on whether those substitutions create a mismatch with the motif or not. So whether they, they because of those substitutions, you now think there is a binding site when there wasn't one before or vice versa. Both of those factors can affect the total number of binding sites in human compared to chimp. 
Um, and you can imagine doing this with two alleles in human. This doesn't have to be used just in these uh, phylogenetic cross-species contexts that I'm describing now. So um, now the question is, is negative three statistically significant or not? Is it important that they're negative three? And of course, that depends on how long the sequence is that you scanned. So negative three means something different in a short sequence compared to a long one. It depends on the base composition and then also on the um, information content of the motif that you're using to scan. So some of them um, have lower information content and you see more turnover of binding sites. So um, there isn't a simple distribution that you can look up a negative three and see whether it's statistically significant or not. So a postdoc in my lab, Dennis Koska, derived a mathematical formula using counting processes and basically modeled uh, two correlated Bernoulli processes where the amount of correlation between them depends on the evolutionary relationship between the two sequences. And using this, he was able to um, calculate a p-value for any pair of sequences and ask whether the net change in transcription factor binding size was significant or not. We did a little proof of principle of this uh, statistic, this transcription factor binding site divergence. And in this case, I'm not talking about chimp versus human. This is uh, zebrafish versus human. And we decided to start with zebrafish um, because we can actually do an experiment in zebrafish that we can't do in chimp. And also because of the, the amount of evolutionary time between fish and human means there's more substitutions. And we expected maybe it would be a little easier of a problem than comparing human and chimp where there's almost no changes. Um, so we started with this just to see if we could do it. And then we moved on to looking at the chimp versus human problem. I'll come back to that. So this slide has a lot on it. Let me explain it to you. What I'm showing here um, on the left are transient transgenic experiments in zebrafish, where we take a zebrafish version of a sequence. We put it in front of a minimal promoter and a reporter gene, in this case, screen fluorescent protein. And then we inject it into a single cell uh, fish embryo. We let the embryo grow up, and then we can put fluorescence onto the fish, and we can look and see uh, what tissues uh, that um, sequence might be driving enhancer activity in, if any. Then um, in the sort of white background to the right, I show a similar experiment, but here we're using a human um, sequence, the homologous human sequence, and we're testing it in a mouse embryo because we can't do the experiment in a human embryo. So it's not exactly a, um, parallel, but it's pretty close. So we're looking at a human sequence in mouse compared to a fish sequence in fish. And on the top row, I have a case where the enhancer activity is conserved. So there's no change in function. And um, what I mean by that is that both are enhancers. So you can see glean fluorescent protein on, in the fish embryo on the left and LAC-Z, which is the reporter gene in the mouse experiment on the right. And both are lighting up at a similar developmental stage in the forebrain. So this is a forebrain enhancer in fish, and it is a forebrain enhancer um, presumably in humans when, um, and certainly in a, when a human sequence is put in a mouse. So we would call that conserved activity. There's no change. On the bottom, which I'm calling enhancer number two, we did the same pair of experiments, but in this case, we saw a change in the expression domain of the enhancer. So it's a hindbrain and a forebrain enhancer in zebrafish, but we see a new midbrain expression pattern in human. And so in this case, the activity is divergent. We see they're both enhancers, but there's a change in the tissue specificity. Now, you might guess that the, two, the pair of homologous sequences, the fish compared to the human sequence for enhancer one, might be more conserved at a sequence level. They might be more similar to each other than the pair of human versus fish sequences for enhancer two, but this is actually not the case. These are equally diverged at a sequence level. So, um, that raises the question, how, when do you see a sequence change or not? And maybe this transcription factor binding site counting that I described on the previous slide might help with that problem. So we repeated this paired set of experiments about 40 times. And then we asked whether the overall sequence similarity was predictive of diverged activity or not, and whether our transcription factor binding site statistic was. So on the top, I showed just regular sequence divergence. So how different are the sequences? Using, and we looked at this using a whole bunch of different measures of sequence conservation, percent identity, fast con scores, et cetera. Um, these are ROC curves. So you have false positive rate on the horizontal axis, true positive rate on the vertical axis. The dotted line um, reflects what you would get if you just guessed randomly. And you can see that overall sequence divergence isn't predictive at all of enhancer activity. But our statistic about transcription factor binding site divergence has a respectable area under the ROC curve. 
So what the idea we're pursuing now in my lab is if we combine this transcription factor binding site divergence with other pieces of information, such as functional genomics data, can we do even better than this? And we're trying to develop right now a heuristic score um, that would capture this information as well as that other information and make a prediction about whether any sequence mutation will have an effect on enhance our activity or not. So eventually we'd like to do that, for example, in a machine learning context like some of the other problems we've been addressing. But right now there's not enough examples of enhancers with either converged or divergence activity to do this as a machine learning problem. So to generate some more data um, and also just to test whether our initial heuristic score, how well it's working, we're conducting more of these enhancer experiments. So here are some results. These are the first seven HARs that we've tested. So now we're back to the human versus chimp question. Um, and what I have here is some of the, each HAR listed with some of the nearby genes. And then I have its score from the support vector machine, and, her, and this is for the prediction of whether it's a developmental enhancer or not. Anything with a positive score we think is an enhancer. Um, but the larger the score, the more confident we are about that prediction. So we investigated HARs with a range of different scores from 3.39, number one on the list, down to things that were barely above zero. Um, and so um, you can see them here. They're ordered with the one that we we're most confident is an enhancer at the top and least confident at the bottom. And here's the result of doing the enhancer experiment in mouse where we put the human sequence in and test whether it's an enhancer or not. And so four of these seven turned out to be enhancers. And um, um, it was interesting and, and um, motivating to us that three out of the four were the top three on the list. So it's not perfect, it's not the top four. There's one that's a little bit further down that turned out to be an enhancer. So this shows that even things with small but positive scores can be enhancers and not everything we think is an enhancer is an enhancer. Um, but hopefully as we get do more and more of these experiments, we'll be able to actually calculate um, uh, uh, area under the curve or performance, other performance statistics for um, not cross-validation, which is I just, what I described before, but now on an independent data set. Um, but so we're encouraged um, and, and uh, particularly happy that the top three, the, the ones that we felt most strong about, if you didn't do this experiment with a range of values and you just started at the top of your list, you'd probably be doing pretty well. So the next question is whether these have different activity in CHIMP compared to human. And so here's how many transcription factor binding site changes there are. This is the net change, losses plus gains, so the absolute value of the change, and it's summed all over all developmentally expressed transcription factors. Um, and so some have more than others, but all of these we picked because we thought that they would have some divergent activity. They have quite a bit of change, actually. And so here's the result of doing the same experiment, but now we put the chimp sequence into the enhancer um, construct instead of the human. And so you can see um, the top three, um, not only are they all enhancers, but there's differences in the tissue specificity between human and chimp. So they are enhancers and the human substitutions seem to have changed their enhancer activity and might have affected the expression of those nearby genes. Um, and then you can see towards the bottom that there's um, HAR34 was tested. Um, it was an enhancer, but we haven't at day E11.5 at least seen any difference between the human and the chimp version. Um, so we're going to continue to do these experiments um, and uh, hope to find more examples like HAR114 that I just uh, mentioned on that table there is one of the ones in the top three. Here's what it looks like in a genome browser shot. It's located between two genes, um, one that's involved in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's expressed in brain and skeletal muscle tissues. Another one, FOXS1, is a repressor expressed in aorta and kidney. Here's our prediction of one of the transcription factor binding site changes. There's a G to C change in the human genome, and that alters whether this is a match for the SRF motif or not. Here are some of the other transcription factors that we think bind differently. And here's the result of the enhancer experiment. We consistently, across many repetitions, um, see positive enhancer activity in heart, limb, and central nervous system for human, and there's uh, consistently no expression in the chimp. Um, so. Uh, I'm going to uh, cut out the last little bit in the interest of time and just move to uh, my conclusions. Um, actually, I'll just move to my acknowledgement. Here we go. Um, so I just want to thank the people I work with, both at UCSF and Gladstone, as well as my collaborators, especially Adam Siepel's group at Cornell. So thanks very much. I'm happy to take questions.
Katie, uh, yeah. here on your left. Hi. Hey. Uh, great presentation. Uh, my question is, um, um, it, it, it's pretty striking that you can actually see differences between human and chip, both testing in the mouse. Right. That presupposes, of course, that the trans right. is, in a way, conserved. My question right. is, have you looked at the cis elements of the transacting factors? to see how much they have changed across the mammalian uh, phylogeny. Right. To basically perhaps support this assumption that yeah. in fact the trans is conserved based on at least its cis exactly. regulation. Yeah, so um, this cis versus trans question is really interesting and we actually looked at it in the set of experiments that we did with zebrafish versus human. So I showed zebrafish in zebrafish and human in mouse. We did a third experiment that I didn't talk about here, but it gets exactly at that cis versus trans question. We did the human sequence in zebrafish. So then if you see a difference between human sequence in mouse and human sequence in zebrafish, it suggests it might be a trans effect. Um, and so we tried to quantify how many times we saw a trans effect versus cis effect, and in meaning that the human in mouse was different from the fish in fish. And um, it turns out we saw almost all cis effects. We only occasionally saw some trans effects. And when we did, it usually made sense for the reasons that you mentioned, that there was either at the protein level or at the level of regulation a difference in the gene. Fascinating. So you could actually trace those trans differences to the cis regulation. Anecdotally, in a few cases. But I mean, we only did 40 experiments. And we only saw, I can't remember, two or three that had these trans effects. So I think that's something to look into more. Um, you would need more examples with trans effects to really quantify whether that was significant or not. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Very cool work, thanks. Um, question, if you believe that uh, you can look at the transcription factor binding sites in, in the ways that you do, do yeah. you think maybe the mutations in the collections of the data, uh, SNP collections out there actually would have an enrichment of those or less of those or? Yeah, so looked? I think <laughs> the exact same methods can be used to look at SNPs and in fact, the Manolis who just asked the previous question, his lab has a tool that's starting to do that and there have been, I'd say about five or six papers in the last couple of years where people are trying to do a similar thing with SNPs. Um, and, um, and I think it's a really important thing to do um, because it's going to help us understand the results of genome-wide association studies where the SNP on the array is almost never going to be the causal SNP. It's going to be something in LD and you'd like to know out of like 10 or 20 SNPs that are in LD which one you think might have an impact in terms of regulatory sequence. So um, I'm not sure if I answered your question or not. For the regions that you're looking for, yeah. have you seen any? Oh, do we see SNPs and HARS? Yeah, well, in the databases out there, so corresponding yeah. to the regions. Yeah, so about half of the human accelerated regions have at least one SNP in them. And typically when we see one, we see quite a few. So most of these substitutions happened more than a million years ago, and they're fixed in the human genome. But then there's examples where there's five or six changes in 100 base pairs, and they're all polymorphic still. So there's lots of people walking around with the chimp version. It will be very interesting to see if they have particular phenotypes. That's awesome. Thanks. We take one more question. Uh, that's talk, Katie. Um, so I was just wondering, besides human uh, accelerated region, have we also looked at chimp accelerated region, and what role do you think they might play in the divergence between him and the chimps? Right, so the question is whether there are chimp accelerated regions and what they look like. This is very important, and um, we're working on a paper right now um, looking at this. I actually did an initial calculation years and years ago, because I almost always get this question when I talk, um, and we're now going back and doing it with all the sequences that are available now. So. Um, the quick answer is that when you switch out human for chimp and you just repeat the same kind of evolutionary analysis, you find about the same number of chimp accelerated regions. So it's not a human specific phenotype to have fast evolving regions. Chimp has them too. If you do them in the Gibbon genome, which we're, we're working on the genome project now, Gibbon has its own accelerated region. So every species has its own. And um, they're about the same number in chimp compared to human. And interestingly, they're also near a lot of developmental transcription factors, sometimes even the same gene. They're not overlapping. They're in different regulatory elements for the same gene. So humans tinkered around with that gene in one way, and chimp has in another way. And what we're going to try to do with this more comprehensive set we're developing now is to really look very carefully if there are any differences in terms of the functions of the genes that are being targeted in the chimp evolution compared to the human evolution. Um, but so far, they look very similar. All right. Thank you.